We work. We live. We innovate and create. At the center of it all is your brain health. The ability to solve problems, think analytically, share empathy, and thrive. We're trying to make brain performance really the next fitness revolution. So how do you boost brain power? Welcome to the Brain Health Project, an urgent call to transform your mind to work stronger and faster. This is an absolute crisis, as great as any we have ever faced. We have to equip the minds and brains of our citizens to cope with the accelerating, dizzying rate of change that they face in their lives. Your brain health is not fixed. Scientific discoveries prove it can adapt and grow regardless of your starting point. Our greatest value, the asset that will help us to change everything, every problem we're in, is all in our head. To harness that treasure, we must measure and monitor progress while things are going well versus waiting for an injury or disease to strike. Too many of us are outliving our brains, and that does not have to be the case. The information age is bombarding us with more content than our human brains can handle. How do you keep from getting lost in this and focus on deep thinking? For starters, stop multitasking. Science shows us that multitasking is bad for your brain. It reduces fluid intelligence, causes brain atrophy, and increases chronic stress. The global pandemic is creating more stress than ever. Stress that leads to depression and anxiety and beyond. Unlocking our potential to navigate these hurdles starts with learning the right strategies, even in school. So when teachers have these strategies, they're empowered to support our learners, and then the learners are now able to take ownership of their learning. Training kids how to think is doubling academic achievement among middle schoolers. I think the greatest national security threat is pre-K through 12. If we don't take care of educating our young men and women, then we have to ask ourselves, where, where are we going to be in 20 years? Our world-renowned scientists know you can increase your brain health, not lose it. It's time for a new category of health, brain health. You are a game changer. Ready to transform the world with us? Be a part of the brain health revolution. It starts here. Welcome everybody. Welcome to Brain Health Presents here for our summer special. And we're so glad to have Dr. Selena Bartlett here, but I'll let I'll let Dr. Pratt and Tony introduce her. And uh, just a quick word about Center for Brain Health. You saw the intro video, but we're really all about not only discovering uh, brain health um, novel ideas and techniques and strategies, but turning them into something we can deliver broadly. And it's, so it's really making brain health real and tangible. And you've heard the phrase, you can give a man a fish and he'll be hungry the next day. If you teach him to fish, right, he'll never go hungry again. And so that's what we're here for, right, is to learn about brain health and learn how we can keep our brain healthy for a longer period of time. So I have the pleasure of introducing our own Dr. Julie Pratt and Tony. Uh, Dr. Frant and Tony heads up operations for our Brain Health Project, which you just heard about. And more importantly, uh, Julie is really all about how to make our brain health strategies uh, more engaging for the folks that we're trying to train. And she also heads up our kindness initiative. She's got a lot on her plate, but she's, uh, she's our host tonight uh, with Dr. Bartlett. So I'll turn it over to Julie. Thank you, Steve. Well, it is my pleasure to get to introduce our speaker, Professor Selena Bartlett. Um, Dr. Bartlett is a world-renowned expert in neuroscience, and she is the leader of um, addiction and obesity at the Translational Research Institute. 
the Institute of Health and Biomedical Innovation and is a professor in clinical sciences at the Queensland um, University of Technology. And so Dr. Bartlett is really an expert in um, explaining why our brains do what they do um, and how you can harness neuroplasticity tools for better health. She is the author of several books, including Smashing Mindset, um, and I recently had the pleasure of being interviewed on her popular podcast, Thriving Minds. So Dr. Bartlett is um, truly a kindred spirit, just so her work is so well aligned with our mission and work here at the Center for Brain Health. So I couldn't be more thrilled to get to hear from her today and for you to get to walk away with some very practical tools that you can use um, for how to leverage neuroscience to become healthier, happier, and stronger. So Dr. Bartlett, I will turn it over to you. Well, thank you. And thank you so much for hosting me today. This is an honor, as you can imagine. Uh, Dr. Sandra Chapman's work has been an inspiration. And uh, to think that she came up with brain health 23, two years ago is just incredible to me. Um, unfortunately, I was a bit slow off the mark. And uh, I really believe from my work of studying the brain now for a really long time, 33 years myself, that this is the, the area which is going to really transform mental health and illness. And I hope to show you some of that um, and, and help your audience to become thriving themselves and work out, I guess the key here is how do you empower yourself to empower your brain to move forward? So with that, we're going to do just a, I'm just going to talk through a few slides um, and then we'll have a discussion. So, so how do you build a thriving mind? And I, I have the great honor uh, to be able to write a column now for an Australian newspaper. And I only agreed to write this column if they titled it Brain Health, because I believe this revolution and shift is so greatly needed because everyone has a brain and we can democratize some of this information. We and I had this great honor of on my podcast, the Thriving Minds podcast, of interviewing this Paralympic champion called Kurt Fernley. And he calls it sharing the cheat codes to the good life. And I just love that so much because I feel like what we're doing is doing that. And it took me a long time to work that out for myself. And what do you mean by sharing the cheat codes? We, he talks about when he was 11 years old, he ran into another person in a wheelchair and they said to him, Kurt, saw off those handles and undo the brake on your wheelchair. And he proceeded to do that. And from doing that, he became independent and he got stronger and stronger and he became really confident in himself. And he said that was a cheat code. And so in his life now, he hopes to help other Paralymp Paralympians to not have to do and go through all the obstacles of life. And that's what this is about, isn't it? Sharing brain health and fitness is helping you see that there are some cheat codes. You don't have to keep struggling and suffering. You can also join this. So that's what I hope to share with you for the next few minutes. So what is the difference now compared to, say, 10 years ago? And fundamentally, and, and this is what I have discovered, is that neuroscience and the neuroimaging technology and genomics revolution has fundamentally changed our understanding of how the brain works and its contribution to good and bad behavior and to what we do. So in this, in this slide here, I'd like you to pay attention to the right-hand side where you see the red blood flow on the top part of the image. And what's happening there, it, that's a healthy brain where it's got lots of blood flow. And, and we can see inside that healthy brain. And what, what we're measuring there is physical connections. So this is a brain that's not too stressed and doing pretty well. Now, what happens under stress, the brain moves over to the left. And what you can see is that blood flow is disappeared. So the brain is still there, but the connections aren't operating as well. And each of us exists between these two extremes all during the day. But if we don't take care of this and learn how to shift the blood flow to the right-hand side, then the brain then slowly starts to fade away. So what can we do to maintain that blood flow pumping to the right-hand side? First of all, we have to understand where our brain came from. We're, we're really not born a blank slate. We like to think that our day started the day we were born. 
but really it didn't. We inherited our brain and we inherited it over many generations. And, and that kind of plays a, a very big role in how we end up leading our life. But the, but the good news is you can change your brain. And that's the concept of neuroplasticity and understanding that the brain's really physical and that you can train it like a muscle. And that's our focus today is we really want to focus on the beauty, the strength and the resilience of the brain and the things that we can do every day to power our brain to be healthy, happy and strong. Neuroplasticity is something that's been around for a really long time. But unfortunately, what happened um, in, a, in the 90s, us neuroscientists did a really, really bad job in the sense that we start to say that the brain was fixed after the age of 25. Uh, we understand the brain's really plastic up until the age of 25, but after the age of 25, we said it's all downhill from there. And that came about because of discoveries in the visual neuroscience system, which really mapped out the brain. And then we started to apply that knowledge across all systems of the brain. So undoing that message has been somewhat difficult and it's something that we really, really strongly focus on here is understanding that even today, I saw a post of a 92 year old that just completed a triathlon in Milwaukee. I've, I've seen evidence of 105 year olds doing triathlons now and, and it goes on and on. And so it's not just about physical feats, it's also about some amazing other feats that are mental feats that people are doing you know, across the whole lifespan. But what is it? that holds us all back. If we're not tapping in to all of our potential, like each of us have this unique potential, um, and why is it that we're not ac accessing that? And it's a question that I, I think about every day. And I'd say the first thing is, is the, our mindset. How much do we want to find out how far we can take ourselves? And I find as I'm out in the world now and meet a lot of people, this is probably the number one thing. And so just teaching um, ourselves, first of all, that we do have a brain that has untapped potential and then asking and becoming more curious about ourselves uh, and asking just how far can I push myself is probably the number one thing that separates people that really tap into neuroplasticity across the lifespan versus people that don't. The other thing and the big, big one is stress that we've inherited over many generations, and I'm going to touch on that. The third thing is what we eat, because um, sugar is highly addictive and it really affects those prefrontal cortical circuits that we showed in the front part of the brain, how much we move our body, sleep. Uh, loneliness is probably what I'm starting to see as one of the number one things and lack of social connections. Um, so, and then having no real purpose to living kind of thing. So these are some of the things that stop us really tapping into trying out all these neuroplasticity techniques. So what can you do? Well, people listening, I would, I would fundamentally challenge you just for today or tomorrow, just step back, stop thinking about your brain as all these problems and start to think about the brain as a supercomputer. And just like any old computer, we have to keep updating our software and our hardware, just like you, know, you see what happens with all the iPhones over decades. So the brain is exactly the same and it should be trained like a muscle. And the thing that um, I came out of my lab to teach, because I run a neuroscience lab, but I also now do a lot of science communication and public speaking, I think that's the number one thing that really transforms people's ability to change their mindset oh my God, I've never thought about my brain like a muscle. I never think about it. I should be training it every day. Okay, so what should I do every day? Well, let's talk about stress because I think that's the one that people would have no indication of how the brain has been formed that allows stress to go in at 10x the rate of happiness and pleasure. So therefore, because we're humans and not animals, we have to fundamentally uh, use our prefrontal cortical circuits, our humanness, to actually change the way stress is being processed by the brain. So this is why I wrote my first book. It was actually called Miggy Matters. And then I uh, did a second version and I called it Smashing Mindset because after all my research of around 25 years, and I'm going to give you an insight to this, it came to me that, um, and to researchers in the field, that stress is probably the number one thing that's pre-wired the brain over generations that leads people to do things like drinking 
alcohol, smoking, gambling, and addiction, because I studied addiction for a really long time. And the bottom line is, without going into details, addiction is simply medication for a stressed brain. So, so what do you mean by you inherited your brain over many generations? This, this front part of your brain, this brain architecture came through over millions of years of evolution. And its number one thing is to keep you safe. I know that we think we're really smart and intellectual, but honestly, the one thing the brain has been built for is to keep you safe and alive from threats and predators. And therefore, that's why when we inherit um, many things over many generations, those things go in fast and they make us feel afraid a lot of the time. So I did my, I don't know how many people online have used 23andMe to sequence their genome. So we often think about all of our problems in our lifetime, or we might even think about our parents' problems. But when you start to sit back and then you go back and sequence your genome and you see how far you've come from, we're actually incredibly resilient. So even though we have all these things happening, that's built on the shoulders of massive amount of resilience. And that's the bit that we tend to not focus on because our brain likes to always be picking up on negative news or negative stories, et cetera. So I just put this up there to show you that just like me, you also come from places that you may not know and all of your brain architecture has been set up in this way to keep you safe and alive. And yes, early life experiences do shape your brain architecture. And it is true that systemic things like poverty, incarceration and poverty mean that it's hard for some people to capitalize on their geniusness. And equally true in, in home situations, these do affect our brain architecture which does make it a lot harder to tap into resilient networks of neuroplasticity, but doesn't mean you can't do it. Your, main, your brain's main job is survival. And let me show you this video to make a point about why that is. Oh. So I don't know how many people online have seen this video, but I'm just wondering if you want to reflect for a second to think what you think is happening there. Why is the cat jumping away from the, why do you think that's happening? And most people understand possibly that the cat thinks that the cucumber is actually a snake because in history, um, our main job is to just see something and jump within milliseconds in case it is a predator. So the thing about that is that's a circuit that's very deep in our brain and it's actually more complicated than just the amygdala, but let's just say it is the amygdala for now. Uh, and it's, it's done such a great job to keep us alive and surviving over all these generations. So humans, just like that cat, have exactly the same circuit. So when we see something, it could be just a cucumber, but we think immediately it's a snake and we'll react the same way. And that can be the same for emails. It can be the same for the way someone's looking at you. We can have the same response inside the brain. Um, and we as humans compared to that cat have an ability to control how we react. So this reaction versus response is actually a deep circuit in the brain that can be trained like a muscle. And we don't ever think of it like that, do we? We always just get bogged down in our fears and all of these things that we don't think we can change. But with proper training, um, we can do that. We, the cat can't but we can. So there's three responses that's happening here is when uh, we either can freeze when we see something that we're afraid of, or we might just run away from something, or we might get really aggressive. And they're the three main behavioral responses to things that might stress us out. So the moral of the story is that stress is simply a cucumber. 
And the thing, and I know, like, I'm not trying to dismiss people's stresses or worries or anything like that, because they are real to you. But equally, what I learned from my own self and my own personal journey was that stress was leading me to overeat and drink and do all of these things because I was completely unaware of how many stresses I was, let, where I was like handling every day and not doing anything about it. So when we're tapping into brain resilience and neuroplasticity, we're draw drawing a line in the sand to the past. And we're saying, yes, that all happened, but I want to change epigenetically, because you can, my future. And that's what this is all about. Because the way stress impacts the prefrontal cortex, it affects executive function. And you hear a lot about this in the Center for Brain Health. These are our central executive function networks, but they're critically important networks that allow us to say no to ourselves, which is called inhibition control. There are, it's our ability to pay attention to something when, uh, when you talk about no multitasking, what you're doing then when you're multitasking is you're disrupting your attentive networks. And tomorrow's lecture, I'll talk a lot about um, newborn babies and attention networks. But this stress, you can see what I mean. Look how it impacts executive function. It's the first thing to, uh, that goes in humans. And it affects all of these different um, functions that are really critically important to putting a life together. But where do you start from? Well, you have to be aware of your brain health. Like how many people know where they sit on the scale in terms of their brain health? We can't just image everyone's brain right now, but we can get a somewhat fundamental measure. And that measurement and quantification is so essentially important, in, as equally important as having the conversation around your brain. That's very healthy in your family. Like what did you do today, Julie, to train your brain? You know, people are totally happy to talk about going to the yoga studio or what they're doing for yoga, uh, for breathing exercises or running, but people still aren't talking in this really positive, beautiful way in their families at Christmas time. What do you do for your brain health? And that's where we want to get to. The second thing is around anything to do with the brain, it has to be customized and personalized. Because if you just look at this data set here, data we collected across an organization, you can see how different people's individual components of executive function vary. So across one organization, like we just focus on working memory or processing speed. So the ability of those connections in your brain to you know, what speed they're going at, it's very different between an individual. And these people are all in high performing jobs, leadership positions, but there's no point someone training working memory if they already have strong working memory. So therefore the customization and personalization is the only way forward in terms of brain health and fitness. And this is where we went wrong. So as you probably know, I developed drugs for a long time at the University of California, San Francisco. Um, so where I'm coming to you is after studying this for a really long time and doing everything in the spaces of mental health and disorders is how I got to brain health and fitness. Um, and it's a, the personalization piece, I think Julie is going to be actually essential for us to make this democratization and to make a big change in mental illness and disorders. And I'll talk a lot about that tomorrow too, the science behind that. But adage, what I've come to see looking at people, we just came from a 90th birthday, my husband's dad turned 90, and he's had everything that you could have in terms of different diseases, but not just him, but other people too. The thing that I notice the most is the attitude and the strong want to live well. This is people's ability to see silver linings in adversity, during adversity, not just in the good times. And I mean, this goes back to Viktor Frankl and many, many people over history um, that do this. And that's why we're, we're here today to have this presentation. But it's the simple things. It's having that cup of coffee. And he uses this phrase as he's drinking it, which no one will understand. But for me, it makes my heart sing. And it's called lovely jubbly. He just has a cup of tea and he says it with a big smile on his face. And he loves that cup of tea. And, and that's what we can all do, but we, we kind of miss the point of that small little thing that, and, it's, and it gets him up every day and it's, and it's not just him, it's many people I see that are thriving across their lifespan. The other thing that's really critically important and I've actually started to increase 
all of this in my work is the value of social human capital and not material possessions, even though we need them to live. Don't get me wrong, the bottom of Maslow's hierarchy is real. And I've sat in his library. Um, my postdoc has his house in Boston. Um, my husband and I were sitting there recently. And what, what is absolutely clear, though, is the your ability to have social connections and the ability to feel supported. So even if you, like, and, and we could talk about that in depth later, but so if you've read about the super centenarians living past 110 uh, uh, right now, and you'll find that they're free of chronic diseases, and what you'll see is the same common denominator. It's that absolutely strong want to live well. So what are some of the things the audience could do? And we can talk about that if I'm running out of time. Mm -hmm. But morning routine. So, so something you could do tomorrow straight away after this presentation is tomorrow morning, the first thing you do when you, when you open your eyes, don't grab your phone, but look out the window and think of three things you're grateful for. And this is not something facetious. I'll show you the science of why that works in the next slide. The second thing is to take a cold shower. And they're going, no way. But in Dallas, it's not too bad <laughs> taking a cold shower <laughs> compared to taking one in Iceland, for example. Um, and then we talked a bit about social connections. These are serve and return relationships. They're critically important for children's brain health development, but also older people and across the lifespan. And the last thing is brain training. Just to touch on the morning routine, because this is something some, anyone can do, is what happens with that when as soon as you open your eyes and don't grab your phone first what you're doing is is you're activating panoramic vision so when you take and you can do this during the day too if you're feeling stressed out you're opening your uh, visual nervous system to a full view and what that does they've shown this is andrew huberman's work at stanford and others it decreases the activation of the autonomic nervous system, which is the stress hormones and other things. So what you're doing is you're training your brain to start the day in that way. And three things you're grateful for is an obvious thing because it gets the brain to start to look outwards. Cold showers, this is work um, of the Wim Hof method and others. And this is uh, Dr. Duadka, who I interviewed on my podcast, who just imaged Wim Hof's brain. And they've shown the science uh, where he can actually, he's completely changed his brainstem, retrained his brainstem and his skin temperature so he can withstand cold temperatures. He can sit in ice for two hours and he can swim under ice sheets and he's trained 40,000 people around the world in his method. And a cold shower is a great way to start the day. I know it's, you don't have to do it straight away. You can start with a warm shower and then turn to the last 10 seconds cold, but it causes an activation of the brainstem, which increases alertness. And it's just another way of tapping into neuroplasticity. And this is his brain here, demonstrating a change in how he can activate. He activates the actual uh, periaqual ductal gray area, which is the analgesic center of the brain. So he's activating and tapping into his own endogenous analgesics as well. So it's really cool. And, and by starting there and then increasing the time, you start to see, wow, I didn't think I could do that. And then within a month, you're like, well, I found that pretty easy. So it's another way of seeing how strong you are and how this innate ability that people don't realize they have to really tap into resilience and neuroplasticity. Um, can you explain what analgesics is for? Oh, so pain, analgesics are the things that relieve pain. So like paracetamol, neurofin, people take here. And then on the stronger end, people might go to hospital. They might get morphine to relieve their pain. So we have our own endogenous one where you can get rele release of endorphins. And there's a brain area that mediates that pain relief that suppresses the spinal activation where pain exists. So when you get, if you're putting your hand into ice, then you you, know, you want to withdraw really quickly. Well, that's a pain response, isn't it? And he showed that by staying there, you actually then release endorphins. That's incredible. So yeah. he's really changed the way he's changed. He's architecting his brain. Absolutely. Of being able to, um, you know, adapt to his environment, but also really create um, neural changes, which Absolutely. is Absolutely. And I know that we've, what happened was, and this is the amazing story, and he's trained lots of people now, and he's in medical journals and everything. So okay. he's not a one-off circus act. People thought he was for a long time, but that happens in our space anyway. 
uh, what he did was he was trained, he lost his wife to suicide actually. She, she died and left him with four kids when he was young. And he went around the world searching because he got a deep depression. He went around searching, he couldn't find anything. And one day he's in, from the Netherlands, he jumped in icy water in the lake and he had complete relief. His brain just stopped. And you'll find the same thing when you start trying this. And I did, I did his method. I've done it all too. And it really does do what he says. And I measured all the parameters, the physiological variables. And basically he went from there. And that's where he started from about 35 years ago. And so do a deep dive on him. I highly recommend it. Um, it's really quite something. But what I love about it for me personally is I hated cold showers, like really hated being in the cold. And what I've now learned is I can jump in cold water now and I didn't think I ever could. And it makes you feel like, wow, what else can I do that I don't think I can do? Mm -hmm. So it's another mindset shifter too. So outside its ability to retrain the brain, it shifts people's ability to see, wow, well, I haven't thought about tapping into that. What else should I do? What else am I missing? It's a way to open your mind to ask questions and become more curious about it too. Yeah, I'm a big fan of cold exposure. Yeah. And I think there's been a lot of hype about cold plunges and yeah. um, the benefits to that. But I think when it comes to specifically understanding how that affects yes. the brain, it's a little bit um, more vague, I think, for people. Yeah. So you explained a couple, one really good one, which is kind of this, um, you know, changing your pain response to actually um, sort of rewiring how that works. And then um, I know there's, you kind of get a burst of, uh, norepinephrine so just even attention attention and focus and energy um, yeah. and then this last one that you're talking about of just kind of it's really mindset of really becoming more open how did that can you talk a little bit more about how that may how cold exposure specifically may um, impact things like depression or mental health well so this is exactly where he end up being and me personally too it also changes the alkalinity of your blood so it causes an increase in immunity so they did an endotoxin study of medical students in the Netherlands and it's published in a paper and he could he could uh, consciously control his immune system as well. So it's not just cold exposure. There's a breathing set of exercises which carbonate the blood and there's some other things that go with it. And it's this conscious control over your system, basically. Um, so it's not just cold exposure, but I like the cold shower as an example for people to, I like little things that people can try that yeah. aren't big things that they have to enroll in a course for six months and then they can actually just try this tomorrow. Mm -hmm. And I always focus on those small little wins first because without those small wins, no one does it. Because sure. it's good. So um, there's many physiological things that happen. And the other thing that's happened that's really going to change the medical textbooks is we don't have an autonomic nervous system. So we've been teaching people forever that we have an autonomic nervous system, meaning we don't have control over breathing or these responses to temperature. Mm -hmm. So that's going to change the medical textbooks as well. That's huge. And same with brain health and fitness. We don't teach brain health and fitness. We teach mental health and illness and how to label people. Mm -hmm. And yes, that's very valuable because I'm a pharmacist, I'm medically trained. So there's a lot of value in... You know, some people need drugs and they need them now so there's a middle way in everything and but this other side too is not just one it, this is not the only other so you don't just do brain health and fitness too right so there's a middle way mm -hmm. and but this other side needs to be taught as well and I think that's where we are now and to be here in this amazing place this center is absolutely beautiful and uh, my hat goes off to all of you that have created it it's absolutely stunning and I'm just so lucky to be here. Um, so in terms of another thing that people tend to do a lot of is start to withdraw from people as when they're feeling a bit low or other things, we actually start to, uh, to pull away a bit. And as, you, as any kind of species, like birds, as an example, they need each other to survive because they have predators. And by being in these big flocks, it actually helps protect themselves from predators. And we're the same. Mm -hmm. And and you see this, and I see this so many times when people are getting older and how many people are there to support them at the end. We need people. So what you're doing now in your life matters. It, you can't ask for people to come if you're not there for people now. Sure. So what you're putting in now comes back to you later too. So these connections, you know, help, you know, build, helping people stay connected with others, that's really important too. 
And I think with the social connections, it ties back nicely to what the concepts you introduced in the beginning about um, stress being kind of our main hindrance or, you know, um, opponent of brain health and how having strong social connections is really helps to buffer against that stress yeah, when it does come. So well, you just think about any time you're with someone, you get to talk to someone about something, it's better out than in, as I say. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Or, or if you just go out and have a drink with someone or a coffee, always feel better. Well, mostly depends on what this conversation was. But in general, being with people um, and feeling su that support is something very critical to human development. Yeah, absolutely. I wanted to I wanted to let you get through the last couple of slides. I don't know. Um, um, the last one was a summary slide. OK. What I could imagine a brain fit healthy society looks like. Yeah. And I well, think we yeah. talk a lot about this where brain health is actually everyone's business. So that's the tag I like to use a lot. Um, because it's so critical to every type of business, it's critical to every family, and uh, being able to start to change and shift that conversation is something that I feel like my life is dedicated towards, um, and and I see how it makes a difference for people to think like that instead of thinking through, oh my God, I've got all these problems, and Selena, can you go and see all my family? They need you or whatever. It's more like, well, let's let me try this for myself first. Yeah, absolutely. So I want to just let you recap kind of those tips that people can do today or tomorrow. What yeah. are those few things that so, someone could do? So I, from, from our work out in the field and working with people, the top four things that people really identify with and, and have said make a difference and something simple to try is the morning routine. I would highly recommend that because it's something you can do tomorrow morning and only do that first. Don't try and do all of these things at once because it won't work. Remember multitasking? So I say that to people now when I'm on that radio interview. <laughs> from, remember the multitasking thing. You can't. You can only do one thing at a time. So the morning routine, and the reason I like that is because it's a great example of most people don't do this. They're either reaching straight for their phone, looking at emails or the news, and, and that really impacts the stress circuits in the brain. So by making that switch, there's a few things that happen. One, you're going to feel better because you're immediately opening your eyes to panoramic vision. Two, you're starting to think of things you're grateful for, and we tend to not do that. And a switch on thinking of three things you're grateful for, a switch is to think about all the all the people that are grateful for, to you. And that's a hard one, right? Because we're so used to being grateful for this. But imagine now sitting back and thinking about all the gratitude or the things that you've done for people. I was just reading about that actually and how truly the benefits to a gratitude practice is not the traditional notion of just I'm going to make a list or a journal or write down these things that I am grateful for but rather I'm going to really reflect on someone else expressing appreciation or gratitude for me and how um, I've kind of been practicing that the last couple of weeks and it's really I, I like have a little note in my phone that I can add to as you know different things come up because I find that you forget them so quickly and so to actually really meditate that on and think about um, how much you know I bring value to this person's life or that I have purpose or that, you know, it matters when I show up or don't. And um, I know you had on the list there of just purpose being yeah. really crucial to brain health. And so I think, um, I think there must be an, an interesting link between kind of soaking in that appreciation and then also recognizing that I, I have purpose in life and, um, and how that helps just immunity yeah. and, and your brain. And it's actually challenging, isn't it? It's not as simple as just naming three things you, like I always think of, this is going to sound really funny, but I always love to think I'm really grateful that I can wiggle my toes because I love running and I love walking and I love being in life. And there's like you saw my beautiful Kurt Fernley, he's our Australian of the Year in 2019, and he would give his he would love to be able to wiggle his toes. Or I've interviewed people that have got one leg that are Paralympic champions who get up every day and they put on their fin and go swimming. Yeah, you know so. So what I've learned over a long period of time is that you think you have it bad, but people that are so much stronger than you that are out there doing it, you know, so there's so many, anyway, so the other thing about the morning routine is if you, you've got to, if you do it uh, the, tomorrow and then the next day and then the next day, but and then by day four, it's all done, you're back to your phone, you can see why it's so hard to make big change in your life. And so the other thing I like about it is the more you practice it, you're building in a new circuit. And that's what it takes to build in a new circuit. Because just as your brain, you know, 
forming these new synapses, new because you're setting up new pathways when you do that from your visual system to your amygdala to everywhere. So that takes time to build. And the older you are, the longer it takes. And so that's why I like these simple ideas and repeat, 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 because then you get confident. Wow, that's just what I do now. I don't think about it because that's what we're trying to get to, right, with brain health. We, we're automatically building in new circuits that are healthy, right? And so cold shower is another one. People love it, especially men tend to love this one more than women for some reason, They and they get really competitive on it. Um, and, and the other thing I like about the cold shower is you start with your warm shower, you could just put 10 seconds on your toes, and then eventually you walk, uh, work your way up, and I put it on the back of my neck because that is the intersection of your spinal cord up to your brainstem and you get a really nice hip. And then you can build that up too over time and, and giving, giving you strength. So the cold shower, uh, the morning routine, the cold shower, and then some people that don't exercise in the morning or moving your body a lot, some people get up and put on their exercise clothes instead of their work clothes. And even if they're just walking around the house, the other one is going outside in nature. That's a big one. Um, and the more you can do that, which is equivalent to a brain break, Mm -hmm. taking lots of brain breaks during the day or breaks um, is really critically important. Yes, absolutely. We talk a lot about what we call a five by five. Yeah. It's one of our, our brain health strategies um, where for five minutes, five times a day, um, step away from what you're doing, whether that's just turning away from your computer, um, standing up, taking a walk, um, looking out the window, um, but giving your brain that chance to reset, allowing your default mode network to take over for some ideas to consolidate. Um, you'll often find that when you do you know, take a break is when you come up with some of your best ideas. Um, a lot of people tell us that's in the shower or, you know, while they're on a run. Um, but yeah, that's really important um, in terms of managing stress, uh, managing that load and um, being able to be what we're talking about here is really sustaining and maintaining brain health for, you know, longevity and, and a longer life. So I think, or not even a longer life, but just within your lifespan that having your brain really thrive. So um, taking breaks, absolutely. And, and I think of it not even as I think of the brain as a muscle, but I think about it as having a thriving life, no matter what's happening. Mm -hmm. Because no matter what you do in your life, there's always a lot of stresses coming at you. You can't change that because if you've got children or you've got elderly parents, like as my husband and I say, we're the sandwich generation because we have elderly parents, four of them, and we have children that are in their 20s and 30s getting their life together. So we're in the middle um, trying to balance it all. So it's not like, you're just going to have a calm life by just training your brain right mm -hmm. it's like it's but you want to be thriving despite anything that's thrown at you so these strategies of the morning routine the cold showers it's not just about having a healthy brain it's it's putting it all together because with mirror neurons which we didn't get to talk about today but mirror neurons people mirror you so if you want to be the person that wants to help your family or whatever when you're doing this, you're actually showing the way without having to tell people you should mm -hmm. be doing this and that. Eventually they copy you and they copy your smile. They copy your happy disposition. And I've noticed that when we go, people go, oh, it's so nice to see joie de vie. You yeah, know, people wanting to live and be happy. And mm -hmm. this was not always the case for me either. So I just want to put that out there. Like I'm a simple little human being. <laughs> <laughs> and I have my days and I have had many things that have gone wrong and in my life and and this is not how I used to be mm -hmm. so I was running a big lab in San Francisco and I went down big time like Wim Hof did and so what I'm teaching you to is something that I learned how to rebuild brain health from all of the work that I had done over 25 years before that too yeah. So I just want to let the audience know yes. that it's, you know what I mean? It, it's like it's from, a daily living thing. Right. <laughs> it's never, it's not a destination. It's definitely a day, it's a day by day. Yeah. And we're human. Um, I, I want you to talk a little bit more about, you know, you talked about uh, reframing mindset, um, coping with stress. What are some other elements of, of brain training um, that you practice or that you would recommend? Um, so I'd say um, my the one that really changed me a lot was reducing sugar, and we didn't really get to talk about in that in my slides. I have to come to her talk tomorrow. She's going to go <laughs> into more depth, but yeah, give us some nuggets. <laughs> yeah, so uh, so I handle my stress with sugar. 
uh, I had a favorite vending machine line <laughs> at the Gallo Center where I, well, I was an alcohol addiction researcher, ran a big lab developing medications for alcohol addiction. So I went in to study the brain as a pathologist in the sense of a pharmacist trying to nail the circuit, come up with a better drug. And my lab was the one that discovered veranoclean for alcohol addiction. And we did all the clinical trials around America. And I got really, I got a lot of funding for that. But I was really stressed out, but I had no idea. I thought I was like a genius. I thought I could like, I had all these plates spinning and how come no one else can spin plates? That's ridiculous. You know, why can't they do all of this stuff? And I had little kids and all of that. And I was like a full-time mum too. Um, and so I, when I'd go to a bad meeting, I'd go to my favorite vending machine spot, which was sugar and chocolate or whatever to, and it made me feel better. And then after we were doing alcohol studies, we had these uh, big experiment going on that I was funded to do and sugar was the control in the experiment. And we had shown a specific pathway was changed by alcohol in the brain, the nicotinic receptors, mm -hmm. which are the alpha four beta subunit where nicotine people that smoke, nicotine binds these receptors. We showed that alcohol did the same thing. And then my collaborator from Stanford Research International calls me and says, oh, my God, Selena, you won't believe this, but the sugar animals are changing and the receptors and the pathways are changing the same way as the alcohol. And I went, no way. <laughs> that can't be true. We both did not believe this because all of the people around many labs in the U.S. use sugar as a control in wow. the experiments. And it's, it's just another drug. Yes. Yeah, so well, it turns out, I think for rodents particularly, because these were animal studies at the time, I think for them, it's even more so mm. addictive. Anyway, so I get back to Australia because they recruit me back to Australia from America. And on that transition back, I was sitting in my desk in Australia and my collaborator calls me. And so then I get have my PhD student replicate the studies for four years because we did not believe the results. <laughs> Anyway, and so at that time, uh, we did re replicate, we published it, and uh, the bottom line is sugar changes nicotinic receptors in the brain the same way alcohol and nicotine do. And then we went on to show it changes the physical structure of the prefrontal cortex, which is the executive function circuits. And if you turn around all the food you eat, and then that's, this is what I did, and, th and then I went, oh, wow, there's sugar in the yogurt that I'm feeding the kids, there's sugar in the orange juice that I'm... And, and then, and I was, you know, rewarding myself after a long run because I was training for marathons at that point. And I, I was rewarding myself with all the highly processed food. It didn't even occur to me that's why I was struggling. Anyway, so I stopped. I was actually started reducing my sugar intake. And that made a massive difference because um, I could feel hungry again. I'd lost my, it, it basically suppresses hormones that make you feel full ghrelin and leptin mm -hmm. so this is the fructose component in sugar because it's processed by your liver and there's high fructose corn syrup in everything yes. and th so it's not just sugar but it's one really big component and that makes you want to eat more of it so that was a big deal for me and, the, and that's one aspect of brain training is that piece because it makes it harder to do these other things is because it's affecting your executive function circuits absolutely well, I want to make sure we have time to get some um, questions yeah. from the audience. So <laughs> we have one here from Wendy. Um, how do I get my brain to engage when I'm dealing with a neuroinflammatory disorder mm. and distractions seem to always get in my way? Oh, absolutely. So this is where the cold shower, Wim Hof method would come in really handy. Mm. Um, and Wendy, I'd highly recommend you try this because uh, and go out and do a deep dive. You can look at wimhoffmethod.com and uh, this is all about how to change inflammatory pathways by uh, increasing the alkalinity um, of your blood through the breathing exercises, but also be highly aware of what you're eating. Robert Lustig, who's from University of California, San Francisco, he's on my podcast and, um, and others, James Mukey. Uh, sugar and these processed foods are highly inflammatory to your body as well. So this and, and exercise obviously helps. And, but I would try food, looking at food and, and then the cold exposure as something to really try first. That's great. 
Um, okay, Deborah asks, how does uh, personality or introversion relate to social connection when it's stressful to be with people? Yes, um, I do understand that. And this is a question for many people. And because you probably inherited introversion, so so I don't know, it's a complicated question, but it depends on how you're raised. So if your family, it was a family that never had people around to dinner or um, or you know, depending on the situation, then you're not used to being around people. So it's really stressful. Mm -hmm. So if you're interested in wanting to see if this can change, because personality can change, you're not set in stone like at all. It just depends if you want to or, or not. Mm -hmm. And I would start small. So just like the morning routine, instead of taking your phone and looking out the window, you ring someone up or do something that's not as stressful first and see if you can build on that and build in those social connections with practice and time and over long. And there's lots of ways of doing that, isn't there now? Right. You don't need to be directly with someone straight away. You can be online and, and you can build it. I just highly recommend trying it and, and not putting yourself in a box. So part of the idea around brain health and, and yes, I am an extrovert and I love people. Um, so I, I do know where you're coming from. There's a lot of people that don't feel the same way at all, but there is something to try if you want to. It's a challenge. Mm -hmm. I, I see life as a challenge and I like to see how far I can change the way I think about myself. So I used to think I couldn't do a lot of things like running at a certain age or triathlons or all sorts of things, but I eventually discovered, oh, well, I actually could do that. <laughs> I just didn't think I could. Yeah. So it's one of those kind of mindset I things, wonder, shifts. Yeah. I want to just emphasize what you said about, you know, that personality can change, that we aren't, we just aren't fixed or set in certain traits that we maybe have been told our whole lives. Yeah. And so that's a huge mindset shift, I think, in being open to trying something new. And I think the other thing with social connections or being an introvert, I uh, resonate with being an introvert and, and the ways that you recharge. But I think it's really more quality than quantity. So it doesn't mean that you need no, to be around yeah. people 24 seven. It means you just need to have a few, you know, really um, solid, close relationships of people that you can depend on, people that are there to help you if you need it, um, you know, to bring you something when you're sick, those kinds of things, um, I think are more important. So it's survival. Yeah, you just, um, so I think just understanding that it doesn't mean that you need to be going out to social events all the time. Um, yeah, absolutely. Different. Everyone, it's just different uh, for different people, but um, highly recommend trying it. And we did a bad job over time because we always like to box people. Uh, don't we like we did Myers Briggs and we we got E F exactly you know, <laughs> ENFPs and ISTJs and and with that that gives us a reason to be a certain way but but it actually if you look at the um, the data it's actually a spectrum and everyone exists across a spectrum yes and those spectrum as you saw with the brain health assessments mm -hmm. they are very different between people but they can be changed through training efforts and and all sorts of things yeah that's a perfect segue because we have a question here that says um dr bartlett talked about some basic ways to measure your brain health um i know the center for brain health has an innovative way to get at this um and will we share more on that so i'll just say um we do have a, a set of assessments that we call you get a brain health index um and so this is something that you get if you are a participant in the brain health project and basically what we're doing is we're not putting you in a box we're not going to give you a label we're not going to say this is you know who you are um but we are going to what it does do is give you a baseline um an understanding of just where am i at today kind of you had that great visual of the brain on the scale and so it's just where do i fall on these um different areas of life whether that has to do with specific cognitive skills or whether that's social interaction um different aspects of daily life responsibility or well-being things like my mood and um you know happiness satisfaction and so um kind of giving you markers to just see okay here's where i'm at today and then similar to the way you may check a scale again in a, in a few months or in a few weeks um how does that change with time and how, specifically how does that change with training and so that's something that um, we are really interested in seeing with the brain health project being a 10-year a, a longitudinal study what does that change look like over time as people start to adopt healthier habits as people um, start to embrace more of a growth mindset and infuse little things like taking a doing a 30 seconds of cold at the end of their shower or um, having a gratitude practice in the morning so 
those are all things that um, we are seeking to measure with the brain health index. And we want it to be really just a marker of change because the brain is so dynamic. And I love your point about um, that it, it's never, you're never too old or too late to start something new, to run a marathon or, you know, seeing these centenarians mm -hmm. um, do things like that is really incredible. Um, okay, we had a, someone ask if you could explain more about the, the Wim Hof breathing technique. Mm -hmm. What does that look like? Um, so the Wim Hof um, breathing technique, uh, you can actually just go on YouTube and 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 for, for people if they want to do it as soon as they get off the call, just go on YouTube and he'll, he'll talk you through it because it's a very specific um, breathing technique, but it's different to normal breathing, like a box breathing technique where you've where you breathe in, hold and breathe out. It's like a, it's over 30, 30 cycles and it's actually carbonating the bloodstream. So he's designed it with measurements. So I've, you can do a, an oxygen measurement. So I had all the oxygen meters on when I was doing it That's to fine. test it all out. Um, and uh, he describes that. So I'd recommend the best step is for people to go onto YouTube or to uh, Google Wim Hof and breathing and he'll he'll guide you through one straight away and you can try it and see yes it's just love it and you feel good I've tried it and before you, yeah it's, and, it's, it's well great. you actually get a release of DMT too into your into your brain and what you get DMT? this so this is like a something like a psychedelic equivalent okay. that we have ourselves um, and then that's where you get that tingling feeling and this release um, that it's kind of like the cold shower in a way but it, but you can just do the breathing exercises well, everyone's um, going to be Googling Wim Hof. It's W-I-M and then H-O-F-F. -F. Yeah, yeah. Highly yeah. recommend uh, looking that up. I think it's really good. That's great. And uh, also the other thing that worked um, for me as I was stepping into this, this curiosity, opening my own mind, because I want to tell you, it took me a long time because I was a medically trained scientist who really thought I needed to pull the brain apart and understand tiny pieces and find the drugs so when I to, for me to shift here it took me about three years and lots of questioning and listening to podcasts and uh, reading uh, as well so I welcome the audience to be really curious and ask lots of questions because the platforms available and information to you now is so incredible and you have a lot of resources at the Centre for Brain Health too yeah, there's so many places you can go to to ask yourself questions about what are the possibilities for your life. Mm -hmm. Like understand that, yes, you came from these places and we all did, but the beauty about neuroplasticity and epigenetics is that you can rebuild uh, no matter where you, what age you're starting from, but the rebuilding, this is the bit I really love, the rebuilding means you're passing on epigenetically three generations forward something positive to your grandchildren epigenetics is said your children and the, your grandchildren so you're making a change away from what you think that extends you're passing generations on. beyond you absolutely just, right in the same way that we have inherited previous generations yes. um their their decisions and choices yeah. we get to then affect but also the resilience but also but, but we tend to not focus on how strong the previous generations were mm. And the thing I love about 23andMe and mapping back and, and watching some series on Netflix, when you look at what they had to do without refrigeration and oh, transportation yeah. Yeah. and no antibiotics, they they're actually incredibly resilient and, and they had it much harder than we did. So when you have that wide perspective, it allows you to be much more appreciative of what we can do, like taking a cold shower, for example. Yes. Or, um, we have so many good questions. I'm going to try to get to a couple okay. more here. Rapid fire. Um, <laughs> so you mentioned curiosity somewhat. Roger asked, what work has been done on the cognitive benefits of curiosity? Oh, there's a lot done on that space. Um, that, uh, the, uh, but to become curious takes a bit of work because uh, these strategies of the morning routine alone mean that you're doing something different. So the brain gets really bored. Um, because it's like a massive supercomputer machine and this is the bit that's missing as people get older they tend to start taking peeling back on activities instead of doing new ones mm. so the longest living people are actually doing new activities and I hope that answers your question around yes. curiosity that's great um okay we have several people asking how do I stop sugar intake when I'm an addict and would using natural sources of sugar like honey or molasses be an appropriate substitute yeah that's a really good question and the only way to go about starting that is remember it's not the sugar that's the problem it's the stress so we always focus on the symptom symptoms but I but the it, it, and addiction is such a strong word 
But remember, addiction is medication for stress. So that's why I do a lot on the cause now and not the symptoms. I used to study all the symptoms. And so I'm just going to tell you that the best way to start is focus on what on the stress first, because then as you build in other things like the morning routine, the cold showers, the exercise, the nature, what you're doing is you're, you're, you're giving the brain the chemicals it needs to handle the stress that's coming at you. And then it won't drive you so much to the other things rather than focusing on how bad you are because you're still eating this and all of those kind of things. It, do, it means that if you start to take it out, you'll go through a lot of withdrawal symptoms and you can read about that. Mm -hmm. So you're better off just starting here and then slowly maybe taking out one can of Coke or whatever it is. That's what I've seen people be really successful. That's what I did too. It's just one item at a time over each week. But my focus was very much on increasing my exercise, standing more because I used to sit, sit for work, you know, writing a lot and all of these other factors. So just know that you've got to focus on the fact that your brain is stressed that's making this happen. So get to the cause and then do all these other things to remap the way stress is driving you to the sugar. I think that's why I wrote the books and, yes. and that's why I, I came to that through lots of hard work and study <laughs> I love that answer right it's not it's getting to the root cause yes. not just trying to yeah. play whack-a-mole with the symptoms yes. but really setting up a lifestyle that is going to help you um, be resilient to that stress so thank you yeah. for all your questions I'm sorry we didn't get to all of them but definitely <laughs> tune in tomorrow um, to hear more about sugar <laughs> yes gosh that was that was awesome and I had the pleasure of sitting in here with Selena's husband Martin <laughs> So we were talking about a lot of these things as we were watching uh, the show tonight. And what strikes me, and this is what we're really all about, is empowering people that you can be the architect of your own better brain. Don't fall victim to, that's just the way I'm wired. Oh, that's just me. That's my personality. You have much more control of your neuropharmacy than people knew even 20 years ago who were educated in neurology. They didn't know this. So you did a great job highlighting that. Uh, Selena, thank you so much. Julie, obviously a great job uh, getting all these pearls of wisdom uh, out of Dr. Bartlett. And we wanna thank the audience, right? We can't do this without you. We can't do it without your support. So this is my regular uh, statement that we are a not-for-profit. So to bring stuff like this to you, all this wonderful content and these wonderful guests, we need your support. We also need your help with the Brain Health Project, right? So don't uh, don't be shy. Uh, uh, Dr. Bartlett talked about it. Don't be shy about learning more about your brain. And you can get access to some of this cool training and strategies by simply joining the project. So there's a QR code. You can scan that. Dive into the project tonight if you'd like to. There's no time like the present to begin. And in September, we're going to go back to a hybrid event. So look for a notice, we're gonna be doing it virtually and live at the same time, much like we did in the past. So for those of you who will be in the DFW area, look for a reason to come visit us here while we put on these great shows. So thank you, Dr. Bartlett. Thank you, Dr. Fratt and Tony. Uh, thanks to the entire audience. Y'all have a good night.